What is going on, fellas? In today's book review, we got The Anti-Social Network by Benz Mesrick. Explains the whole GameStop short squeeze and why and how it all happened. So in the beginning, you had a guy named Keith Gill, aka Roaring Kitty. He bought a bunch of call options and shares back in 2019 with GameStop that expired around 2021 of April. So basically, he had a $53,000 bet and pretty much all options that GameStop was going to go up over time against all of the bad things happening in the world. So growing up, the guy named Keith Gill, more of a working class Wilmington in Brockton, Massachusetts, one of children of three whose father drove a truck for a living and mom who worked as a registered nurse. City of Champions where Tom Brady won Super Bowls. Keith was the fastest kid in his hometown high school and college, and he ran 800 meters in 152, 100 meters in 224, and a 403 uh, mile, which put him in the elite of college runners. Fewer than 1,500 in the world broke the four-minute mile, and Keith was a few breaths away. Keith rented a house and had a wife and kids at a job at 34 years old. Worked as an insurance company like Mass Mutual. His day-to-day -day life, he developed educational classes that financial advisors could represent to prospective clients. He was the first in his family to graduate with a four-year college degree, competing with brainiacs from Harvard and BU, Boston University. From 2009 to 2017, Keith Gill had spent much of his time unemployed. He started working at Mass Mutual in 2019 at the point two years prior had been completely out of work. This job was in finance. His mother said as a kid that he would always, or he was always good with numbers and he loved looking for edges that other people did not see. By college that morphed into doing deep research, poster on the back of his wall at his office in his crib that says, hang in there. He had a three monitor setup. Keith would live stream stocks, charts, calculations, and trading statements, 10K forms, financials, predictions, and outside the box thinking. Next to his keyboard, he had his handy dandy Uno deck. And next to the Uno deck was a red bandana. And next to that was a beer. And next to that was a magic eight ball. As a kid, Keith would ask it about girls, sports, things like that. But when you didn't like the answer, you could always keep shaking it until you got the answer you wanted to hear. It wasn't all that different from the way most people at his day job picked the stocks they were selling to their customers. If a stock chart didn't look good at first glance, turn it upside down, there was always a way to convince someone to buy it. In his portfolio, he held a different variety of stocks through multiple online brokerages, mostly in option calls to extend his leverage. He started live streaming and making YouTube videos under the name Roaring Kitty, teaching mostly self-taught trading strategies, which revealed around finding value that other people had missed. Targeted research and deep diving, including hard work, attention to detail, and the most delusional optimism. The YouTube channel had been accompanied by a Twitter account as well as a Reddit account posting regularly called Deep Fucking Value. Wall Street Bets was dedicated to high risk, high reward bets like a glorified casino YOLO. The guy named Rog Roganinsky, who founded the Reddit thread, got removed from the board he created because he was trying to monetize it for his personal gain. Martin Shelley at the time was a moderator, a hedge fund, uh, Iconist, Pharma Bro, raising prices of drugs needed to observe levels for purely profit who eventually went to jail for securities fraud. Wall Street Bet's logo slash mascot, mascot is the image of a blonde haired trader in sunglasses and a suit and tie something out of an 80s video game like 4chan had a Bloomberg terminal. Kind of look like this. Diamond hands. Robinhood is so different from every other online brokerages clean and slick, easy to use interface where you could understand everything. I like to compare it to the Apple iPhone. It's just so much better than an Android and any other phone. The two co-founders, Vlad and Beju, two immigrant kids from Vlad from Bulgaria and Beju from India, who met as undergrads at Stanford, both majored in math and physics. In 2008, Vlad went to the grad school in UCLA to become a math mathematician. Beju went to a trading firm near San Francisco after 2008 crash. They went on to build a startup to offer highly sophisticated tools to hedge funds and banks who were clawing their way out of a turmoil by turning in automated strategies to trade ahead of retail orders, front running them, payment for order flow. Flash trading, Bernie Manoff came up with this idea. And as it was known, which turned pennies made on large volumes of tiny spreads into billions of dollars. 
So for you guys that don't understand that, Robinhood is a third party, so a market maker above them. Robinhood was able to offer free commissions because the market makers would literally pay Robinhood for that math. And on every trade that happened, let's say someone wanted to buy a stock at $1 and one cent, they would buy the stock before at a dollar and then sell it to them and make a penny on every single trade. So the more volume, the more money the market maker made, which is kind of sketchy and not really good at all. Basically helping the rich people get richer, Robinhood's plan was simple twofold. Offer regular people commission-free trading and do away with minimum account balances. The app would be built around the smartphone, not the computer. Opening an account was as easy as logging into Facebook search. For anyone uh, for any one stock, it gave you all the info you needed, the price chart, the one day, weekly, monthly, yearly, five year, a big fat buy button to trade. The color scheme was so gorgeous, just like the iPhone, visual, audio, and tactile incentives along the way, just like a slot machine uh, that rained confetti when purchasing shares. They turned the sophisticated stock market into a highly playable video game. Two million users by 2018, Robinhood was able to offer zero commission because their users weren't actually the customers. They were the product, just like Facebook or Instagram. Robinhood sold their users' trades to market makers, giant financial firms like Susquehanna, but primarily Citadel, who could nearly instantly analyze the trading flow and profit by taking tiny margins between the bid-ask spreads, more volume, more money the market makers would make. Dude, everyone thinks I'm crazy, and I think everyone else is crazy. Uh, another quote from Keith Gill. I expect the narrative to shift in the second half of the year when investors start to look for ways to play the console refresh, and they begin to see what I see. Keith first started buying games in, of GME, and or shares of GME, in July 2019, seeing that it was vastly undervalued. GameStop was the only video game company in the growing industry at 150 billion and more in 2019. Also such a nostalgic brand, they shifted to more from Bicker Motor into e-commerce. The short side of GME was over 100% shorted shares uh, that are, it was shorted 100% more shares than even existed. And even 20% of the astronomically high. If a stock is at $10 and you, the best case scenario for the company, it goes to $0, you make 100% gains tax-free if the company files for bankruptcy. If the stock goes to $20, you lose 100% of it. And if it goes to $50, you lose 500% of it. If it goes to $1,000, or if it goes to $100, you lose 1,000% of it. If it goes to $483, like it did, you lose 4,800%. Their infinity losses the short selling. Um, in order to short a stock, you need to borrow it from someone for an upfront fee and pay interest on it every single day. Somehow, if you own one share, you can lend out that share to five different people. It makes no sense creating four synthetics. Prime brokerages like market makers and banks could naked short stocks. They don't even need to locate. They can do that out of thin air for liquidity purposes, controlling the price to whatever they want. They can FTD, which is failure to deliver a stock. They can route your trade and buy to a dark pool so it doesn't affect the price of the stock on the exchange right there. And they can use puts and calls to hide their shorts, FTX tokenized security tokens that weren't even backed one-to-one -one with shares, but counts on the books. The brokerages you have in your shares, uh, they can lend to shorts without your permission of knowledge and can make money from the fee and interest and not even pay it to you. Hidden swaps off exchange agreements, but when the stock goes up and shorts are down at a thousand percent, everyone is buying shares and no one is selling if the shorts close, the price will astronomically shoot high. The pressure becomes so high, <clears throat> a so-called short squeeze, uh, mostly famous in 2008 when the German automaker Volkswagen went from $200 to 1,000 in two days. <clears throat> at peak, the valuation of the company went to two trillion, the biggest market cap ever at the time. And if they didn't shut the <clears throat> off the buy button at GME at $483 uh, and had such little shares in existence, GME's price at the same market cap would have been worth $10,000 a share. So for those of you who don't know, the price of the stock doesn't make how much it's worth. Apple stock can be at $100 right now and Chipotle could be at $1,000. It's about how many shares are in existence and then you divide that by uh, the price of the stock to get the, or times it by, to get the market cap. <clears throat> so even though GME might be at $400 a share, the market cap might only be at $40 billion versus Apple, who's, it might be at $100 a share, but they have billions of shares in existence and GME had, say, 60 million shares in existence. <clears throat> Same thing happens with Herbalife, stock by or stock shorted by Bill Ackman's hedge fund, and Carl Icahn bought it, led to a squeeze that 
uh, that alleged pyramid scheme Herbalife, which cost Ackman $1 billion and Icon, he saw how much it was shorted. And so he came in to squeeze them. So it doesn't matter about the fundamentals. If everyone knows someone's short, you just go the other side of the street or the other side of the trade and you squeeze them. So if Keith Gill was right with GME and the stock went up instead of down, it would be like watching investors trying to get out of a burning building through one single narrow way door. The stock would rocket. The short selling could be one of the riskiest plays in the market. You would really need to be certain that a stock was going down because your upside was so limited. But your losses could theoretically be infinite. So GameStop stock was a ticking time bomb waiting to be ignited shooting to the moon. He had 53,000 mostly in call options expiring April 16th, 2021, and some share options trading is extremely leveraged, but your losses are capped at what you spend. If the price moves up and you bought calls, you make a lot more money, but if it doesn't go up and it stays stagnant or goes down, you'll lose all of it. Your options will expire worthless. Fun fact, 80% of all the call options or options in general that are bought by retailers expire worthless. So when Keith Gill originally posted his GME positions on Wall Street Bets, his response were mockery and hostility. Everyone thought he was dumb. Turns out in August 2019, it spiked 20% as the famous investor, Michael Burry, who shorted the housing market in 2008 and made billions. Movie you guys haven't watched yet, it's called The Big Short. Written a letter to GameStop's board revealing a 3% stake in the company, bought 2.75 million shares, and believed GameStop stock was in much better position than anyone released. So when the stock was trading at a few dollars per share, 250 to $4, $5, the market cap was 200 million on the company when they were doing revenues of five to seven billion a year, which is like pretty much unheard of. Uh, Burry pointed out that the upcoming console cycle, which PS5s and Xbox Series X was going to make money for GameStop, and that wasn't in the equation for the shorts, uh, the cycle was coming out and they still hadn't abandoned the disk drives. The disk drives were still there where they could even make even more money. Keith's investment doubled to 113000 and Keith knew that he could have changed his life with that money, perhaps buy a house, go on a trip, but with Burry, it wasn't about to sell. When Corona pandemic happened and all GameStop stores closed, Keith's position went back to what he bought it at. YOLO trading strategy, all in one bet, you only live once. Things really began to ramp up when Ryan Cohen, on 28th of 2020, acquired 10% of the company, 9 million shares at $8 a share for, for 76 million. Cohen sold his company Chewy for 3.53 or 3.35 billion in 2017. At the time, the largest e-commerce sale of all time leading up to that point. The next couple of months, GME 5 x and deep fucking values position went from 53,000 to over 1 million by December 25th. Remember, he's buying options, so if GME 5 x his other positions 20 x And that was the bit, like so many different big things happened in order for this play to happen. It literally it was the perfect play the way that it played out and if all these different things didn't happen it probably wouldn't have went as well as it did ryan cohen buying in is one of the biggest things ever the guy was bored 30 something years old already made three billion dollars and was bored with life only invested in apple and wells fargo he didn't buy real estate didn't buy fancy cars he wanted purpose in his life so he invested all that money up until december something and he started to change things around in the company because in a lot of these companies for a lot of people don't know not only will hedge funds short a stock, they own all the news outlets to then trash in the stock. They'll put in bad people into the executive board of the company and make them ruin their financials. So they short them to the ground, they make money on that end. And then on the other end, they buy Amazon stock and then Amazon might acquire that company for really cheap. And Amazon goes up while those other smaller brick and mortar stores and all those small companies get squashed to the ground. <laughs> If you already or if you're already rich, it makes sense to diversify your portfolio, take away the risk and get solid returns. But if you're an average person, diversifying is just a way of treading water, earning a little here and there won't get you anywhere. Instead of listening to other people, do your own research, dive deep and have conviction and go all in and ignore the noise outside. People were no longer I don't understand why people want to retire at 40 or 60 years old. Dude, I'm trying to get rich now. People were no longer trying to buy GameStop to make money. In fact, it was the opposite. People were happy to see a hedge fund run by rich men in suits preying on a company to go bankrupt. To lose every penny and stick it to Melvin Capital. Melvin Capital is the main person that was or main hedge fund that was shorting GME. They've been doing it for around six years, from forty dollars a share all the way till now when it was shown at four dollars, and making their hedge fund implode. GME wasn't just a stock anymore, it symbolized something bigger than itself. 
99.99% of people versus the 0.001%. The bubbling anger and confusion and boredom of millions upon millions of people that were stuck in their homes, losing their jobs, watching the bank accounts dwindle. Shorts do not make sense with the companies way overvalued, companies performing poorly or were mismanaged, or where an industry was being overran or were simply likely to fail. All short sellers are future buyers of a stock. Melvin started shorting GME in 2014 at $40 a share. Melvin saw GameStop as an archaic business model selling new and used video games in physical stores while the market was being overtaken by digital downloads via the internet. And seemingly no forward strategy to survive, they would need to reinvent themselves. And, in sense, or, and since then, they were going from $40 to $4 as predicted. Even as the gaming industry ballooned, GameStop's profits disappeared. The pandemic hit and all of GME stores were temporarily closed. In 2019, losses of $470 million at $5.38 a share. 2020, losses of $215 million at $3.30 a share. GME continued to fall to $2.57 and then hovered around $5 in 2020. Melvin increased its put options and had to file a 13F publicly displaying their short position. Why would publicly showing it make the big difference? Certainly one couldn't predict that a bunch of anonymous people conjugating on a subreddit board called Wall Street Bets would suddenly single out Melvin Capital. To represent all the short sellers taking aim at GameStop, everyone slowly started to hate on Melvin Capital and try to implode them. By the end of 2020 quarter, Melvin shorted another 600,000 shares via put options, $130 million worth. Mathematically, GameStop is still a dime brick and motor store. Now, the short interest was 140%. That means they shorted, if there were 10 shares in existence, they shorted 14, four more than even existed of the float. Um, so many companies on Wall Street knew that this company was going to the ground and they were willing to keep on borrowing shares to short it. So many shares that almost half were being borrowed more than once. No number of angry posts could change the fact that smart money was on the short side of this trade. And it was unlikely, if not impossible, the stock could get disconnected from its fundamentals by being pushed by retail traders. Wall Street Bets wasn't populated by professionals. It was mostly amateur gambles that called themselves retards, apes, and degenerates. Jim Cramer says, we like the stock. We like the stock. Um, with 140% short interest and only 60 million shares in existence, which is so, so small, 80 million shares need to be covered if the stock started to run, and that would be a major issue for shorts. On January 11th, 2021, Ryan Cohen announced he and his friends from Chewy were going to join GameStop's board. He previously owned 5% stake in the company back in August, and now he added to 10% in November. The additional shares included the letter of the company to their management team. Pointing out everything they've done wrong and demanding they pivot toward online gaming, building up their e-commerce presence, and try some innovative strategies such as getting into esports, streaming, and mobile apps. At the time, GameStop hadn't seemed overly receptive to an agi agitating outsider, but that news today was completely 180% turn. Ryan Cohn was riding in like a white knight to save the company, and now Keith would be eating tendies and drinking beer. That evening, and Cohen joined the board. It meant there was a real chance he could help reinvent the company the way he reinvented the pet food business against Amazon. In January 13th, GME went from $20 to $31 a share. January 19th, 2021, there was a st once a stock put to see the name of the stock was GME. The price blew up and the shorts dipped down. Hold my bully, boys, hold. Soon may the tendy man come to send our rockets to the sun. One day when the trading is done, we'll take our gains and go. She had not been two weeks from ashore when Ryan Cohen joined the board. The captain called on all hands and swore he'd take all of his shares and hold. Soon may the tendy man come to send our rocket to the sun. One day when the trading is done, we'll take our gains and go. Andrew from Andrew left from Citron Research. Uh, on the day GME hit $43 said and tweeted out, the five reasons GME buyers at these levels are suckers. Stock back to $20 fast. As soon as this tweet happened, it went all over Wall Street bets and they started to go after Citron Research as well as putting all their money into GME against them. A kid played with options, 22-year-old named Alexander K. Korn committed suicide when Robinhood account balance reached $730,000 in the negative. The loss was due to Robinhood and not him, and his balance should have been at $0, and the kid thought he had to pay all of it back, so he committed suicide, which that is 
Not good at all. We don't like any to see any of the homies check like that. It's T plus two clearing. So when you buy your shares, it takes two days to clear somehow, even though everything nowadays is instant. Your shares aren't really in your account instantly. Each day at 10 a.m., each market day, Robinhood to add to insure its traders by making a cash deposit to federally reserved clearinghouses and the DTCC, which is the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. So think about when you buy your shares, the Robin or all the brokerages like Vanguard, Robin, and TD Ameritrade, you don't actually own your shares. Those are the middlemen. But below you is you buying it and them. Then you have the market makers on top slash the clearing corporations that make the trades actually happen. Um, so each market day, Robinhood would insure its traders by making a cash deposit to a federally reserved clearinghouse, the DTCC. That deposit was based on volume, type, risk profile, value of equities being traded. The riskier the equities, the more likely something might go wrong between the buyer and their seller, and the higher the deposits had to be. To say what was happening with GameStop was unprecedented would be an understatement. The stock doubled the last week, and this week, 194 million volume on the daily, high of a 76.76. 913,000 calls had to be traded uh, via call options, written was $60 was the max. So all the call options, for people don't know, the stock price was past the max call options of the day, which is insane, and all of them expired in the money. The stock was halted four times that day, and if a stock gets halted within 10 minutes, if it more, moves more than 10%, it'll get halted, which means the volatility and people trading it is a lot. Uh, the stock was halted four times, uh, and Citron Research was getting death threats to family and harassed. As the days went by, you could use margin 50% on GME that eventually went to zero. Citadel now processes 40% of all retailers' trades. The thing about the low probable events, Black Swans, is that they are once-in-a-lifetime opportunities. January 25th, 2021. I'm not selling until at least $1,000 a share. GME, buckle the fuck up. $1,000 plus seemed crazy until you saw everyone YOLO their life savings, showing screenshots saying diamond hands. The Friday before GME closed at 65 a share, when GME opt, it was at or opened on Monday morning, it was at 96.73 and had a high of $160 and slowly crashed to 60. When I or, hmm. all of deep fucking value shares went all the way from 53,000 to 14 million that night, the night on the 25th, when it ended around $80 a share. Not just the business that shows, but networks everywhere were showing GME and coveraging it. Elon Musk, CEO and chief techno of King Tesla CEO, CEO and chief designer of SpaceX, Dogecoin enthusiast, Bitcoin prod oppressor, and sometimes the richest man in the world. Elon didn't just identify with the retards and apes on a or philosophical level. Because they were rallying behind a company they loved, trying to survive this crazy pandemic year. But he also connected with them on a professional level, sharing the anonymity. Don't know why I'm having more strokes right now, but we'll continue. For an enemy that was very much mutual, that enemy had once destroyed Elon himself. Or at uh, least his flagship company. Tesla's battle with the short sellers was well known, almost as much for Elon Musk owns public rants. Mostly to Twitter, as for it had affected his company's bottom line. Those shorts of billion dollar hedge funds had been coming after Tesla and Elon since it IPO nearly 2012. Short sellers didn't just bet against the stock, they often helped push it down through negative news stories and public agitation. Giant banks employed armies of analysts that could downgrade a stock at any time they want. Like his ideological siblings on the Wall Street bets board, Elon had taken the battle personally and hadn't merely been angry at short sellers, but apparently he had been disgusted by Wall Street practices, abetting on the failure of others. And another tweet, he had gone far to rename the SEC, the Short Sellers Enrichment Commission. Elon wasn't just trying to sell a product, he was attempting to engineer a dream. But the shorts don't profit from dreams, they profit from nightmares. Every little problem with Tesla, they would make articles gaslighting it. Even though Elon beat the shorts, he never forgot the trauma. What short sellers do uh, should be illegal. Elon wasn't asking sure or wasn't exactly sure how he was going to get involved with GME, but he did know was that the chance he would remain silent was very close to nothing. January 26, 2021, GME opened up at $80 a, a share and it slowly climbed to 147 at the end of market. There was more than just retail buying. Now whales were riding the wave and people were buying the max call options at the day was 115. 
Um, and it was forcing the option set or forcing the option sellers to hedge their options. So a lot of times with the options, it's something called a gamma squeeze. So if the max option is at 115 per se, and everyone just starts spamming the 115s and the stocks below it, as closer it gets to 115, the, the people who sell the options, each option is worth 100 shares, they have to hedge against it. So ideally, they want to keep buying shares until they have 100 when it goes near 115. If they don't, and someone exercises it, they're going to have to lose a lot of money and spend more money above the cost of it, if that makes any sense for you guys. So billionaires like Papatia, who was the, I want to say, CEO, CEO of Virgin Galactic, he bought $115, and he was the owner of the wall, he was the part owner of the Warriors. He bought $115 max call options and tweeted it out on this day. In 2008, sentiment was growing with big Wall Street um, and the left retailers holding the bags of parents that lost their homes and jobs, and now it's their turn. A normal person would see how they did this. 140% of a company was shorted. That's the game they've been playing for many years, and now that game is done. On the 25th, there were 1 million members in Wall Street Bets now and 2.5 million. Rising eight minutes after market close, your boy Elon Musk tweeted Game Stock. And then from there, the stock went from 147 after hours all the way to 260 within an hour or two. And then everyone started knowing, knowing about it around the world. Musk had 42 million followers at the time on Twitter. Ken Griffin, the CEO, CIO, and founder of Wall Street uh, behemoth, Citadel, with 38 billion under management via subsidiary of Citadel Securities, 40% of all retail stock traders flowed through biggest conflict of interest in financial history. Imagine you're the market maker that gets the access to every single trade that happens for the most part, and then you have your own hedge fund and you're able to see everything. It just like seems like they're the referee and the player at the same time. Ken Griffin in high school in the early 1980s had mass had a he had a master's computer programming. He launched his first company in 11th grade selling educational software via direct mail. He went to Harvard in 1986 and he shifted into stock trading um, and his first fund with $265,000 raised from friends and family in 1987, which my friends and family would give me $250,000 uh, at the age of 19. He put an enormous satellite dish outside of his dorm and attached it to the roof of a Cobit house. So he could receive stock quotes, shorting stocks since 87, first year out of college, he was given a bankroll of 1 million at a hedge fund called Glenwood Capital. He made 70% on the 1 mil and then went on to start his own hedge fund, Citadel. It was built around Ken's strengths, math, computer programming, and a belief in technology over the next decade. He grew his fund into well over 10 billion under management. Ken's market making capabilities were the best in the business and was able to give his customers the best prices possible of execution. It made companies like Robinhood a commission possible, a win-win scenario. Melvin Capital, Gabe Plotkin, Point72, Steve Cohen, and Citadel, Ken Griffin, all shorted GME and all lost money on it. Wall Street doesn't need to change the rules because they are already on the winning side of the game that is set up. Apparently, Ken couldn't and would never do anything unethical ever to tip the scale in Wall Street's favor, but he could certainly, he could write Melvin Capital a check. Did you lie under oath? Did you have any contact with the night of the buy button being turned off? Look, let's look at the five lawyers sitting next to him in the room telling him exactly what to say. He said, let me be clear with you. Absolutely not. Ken, later down the line, did have contact with Robinhood CEO Vlad Tenov in text, emails, and phone calls and said otherwise. In January 2019, Ken bought $238 million on a New York City apartment, a world record at the time, or $122 million mansion in London, $130 million in the Hamptons, and $130 million in Palm Beach, $700 million into charities revolving around art and education, donates to both politics or politics political parties, Ken infused Melvin Capital with $2.75 billion in exchange for an undisclosed piece of the company at the time. January 27th, 2021, at 10 a.m., 30 minutes after market opened, GME was at $320-ish and went to $360, slowly fell to $260, and then showed at $320. Deep fucking value posted his yellow screenshot at $320 a share, and he had $47 million. So we went from $53,000 Mostly call options to 47 million in around two years, which is one of them. That's probably the gnarliest trade of all time. And if they didn't turn off the buy button, he'd probably have hundreds of millions, if not billions. 
Wall Street Bets Discord server shut down. Reddit Wall Street Bets gets put on private so no one can join. CNBC says Melvin closed their shorts, which we knew they are lying on national TV. They ran ads on Twitter saying they closed their shorts. It was hysterical. January 28, 2021 at 5 a.m., Vlad Tanov awakens with calls and texts through the roof. That was the CEO of Robinhood. The Clearinghouse, which needed $3.7 billion in deposits to cover their capital requirements for trading. The two-day process it takes for the trade to go through, while the company's customers' money is temporarily put to the side, essentially in an untouchable safe. For the two days it took for the clearinghouse agency to verify that both parties were able to provide what they appeared or agreed upon, the brokerage house Robinhood had to ensure the deal with a deposit of money on its own, separate from the money that its customers provided that could be used to guarantee the value of the trade. In finance, it is collateral value to risk in a simple stock that says if a stock's at $400 and someone put $400 into it, but if a stock like GM or that's like a non-risky stock, someone put $400 into it, they don't need to throw up any extra money. But if a stock's very volatile and things are unprecedented, maybe the person put $400 up and then Robin then needs to put another $400 on top of it. Um, the customer put to buy because of the volatility of the stock. Robinhood has until 10 a.m. every day to satisfy the deposit requirement of the upcoming day of trading or risk being in default, which could lead to an immediate shutdown of all operations. So instead of paying the collateral, which they did not have, the money for they shut off the tickers and that reg required a lot of margin. So at the time, I want to say they only had 700 million and they were they had a three point three billion dollar margin requirement. So it's either. They all the bond like every person that traded a stock on Robinhood, they couldn't do anything if they enabled it. Where you couldn't buy or sell, or they shut off some tickers like GME, AMC, Cost, BBBY, and you couldn't buy them, but you could sell them. Uh, I think I'd probably rather have that than not being able to literally sell or do anything. So instead of paying the collateral, which they didn't have the money, they shut off the tickers that required a lot of margin. By 25th or January 25th, the deposit requirement was 125 million. By the 26th, it was 291 million. Um, and the 28th, the magnitude higher of 3.7 billion. It seemed obscene. Robinhood only had 700 million cash on hand and couldn't pay the other 3 billion. Vlad could see why the volatility on GameStop was unprecedented and almost all buy orders said they couldn't offset it with sell orders. And since GME's float was so short, so much of the overall risk grew exponentially to compare the biggest special charge before GME was 25 million. Robinhood had to raise 3 billion in five hours at the time. Robinhood had 20 million users on average of 28 to 31 year olds with an average account size of 3,500. Every brokers turned off the buy button, not just Robinhood. If they didn't shut off the buy button all, at all, the users could sell their or wouldn't be able to sell their GME as which probably would have been worse. You couldn't blame Robinhood or Vlad for this because it wasn't him, it was his pre predecessors, the people above him. Also true, Citadel, who by coincidence handled most of Robinhood's trades, that was a market maker, coincided, provided the lion's share of Robinhood's profits through its payment of order flow. So the person that told them or that colluded with them is like, they're the ones that get all the trades from them. So everything is just not looking good for them. So now a financial stake in Melvin Capital from Citadel, most all uh, of it's associated with the short and that helped lift bail Melvin out from the previous financial situation. So you had someone bail out someone who definitely had a say in, you know, or had a financial investment in something where they turned off the buy button. It's just not just too many coincidences in one. We had 2.75 billion infusion of cash along with Steve Cohen. All of this happened right after Wall Street Bets was silent, silenced, put on private and the discord was banned. Keith Gill, I am not a cat. What's an exit strategy? GME peaked at 500 plus on the pre-market high of the day of $483. AMC, BBY, BB, Express, Cost, and Naked, and Nokia were all blocked. The same short basket and cost in two days went from $2 to $120. So it wasn't just GME, and all these other stocks were flying to the moon as well. And your average person wasn't buying all those other stocks too, so it makes you really wonder. Keith later that day stumbled upon a YouTuber whose Twitter handle was, oh my God, it's Birdman, a YouTuber that I've watched before in the past. An app named Robinhood stealing from the poor and giving to the rich can't make this up. Robinhood mass emailed, we are restricting transactions for certain securities. They should have just said the millions of Robinhood users could no longer buy GME through the app. Along with a half dozen other meme stock, basically anything that Melvin Capital and their Wall Street colleagues had shorts and were trying to cover 
It seems as if they were trying to stop the squeeze because retail couldn't buy, but institutions could do whatever they wanted still. And to the next day, you could buy one share and then you ended up buying three and then five and then 10. So imagine they shut off the buy button and then three days later, you could buy one share. The next day you could buy three, then five, then 10. And then finally they unleashed all of it, which is crazy corny. Then a week later, um, end of the each update YOLO by Keith Gill, he posted, he had 44 million in his account with diamond hands on that day when they shut off the buy button. Maxine Waters, chairman of the House of Committee on Financial Services, called for a hearing. Dave Portney started calling off all the enemies on Twitter, along with A-list influencers and billionaires. January 29th, 2021, GME opened up at 325 and as high as 413 a share. Institutions could also short the top of 500, making crazy money from the buy button being turned off as well, which is... You know, not cool. Melvin said during the hearings, Melvin Capital, the one who first originally was a shorter, the biggest shorter of them all, said during the hearings, they closed their shorts in GME before the buy button was turned off and they had to say or communicate with Rob, or they didn't have any say or communication with Robinhood. And how would that affect them if they already closed their shorts? Also, Melvin Capital wasn't bailed out by Citadel. Citadel was proactively uh, reached out to them and became an investor because Melvin was at a discount after losing half their value in such a little time. Uh, as for Gabe's fault, Citadel saw a hedge fund that lost half of its value as a good investment. It was an opportunity for Citadel to buy low to be sure Melvin was managing a difficult times. So we are not seeking, we they weren't seeking a cash infusion. It was like defending himself with a shotgun attempting to blast away holes in a conspiratorial narrative that had been building up on social media for the past two weeks. When our research suggests the company will not live up to expectations and its stock price overvalued, we might short a stock with GME and the ground beneath that trade could not have been any firmer. Specific to GameStop, we had a research support view well before the events. In fact, we have been short GameStop since Melvin's inception six years earlier. Because we believed and still believe that the business model, Gabe knew that much of the audience and the rationale fell on the deaf ears. They weren't looking for financial advice, they were looking for someone to blame. It was a young boy in Bulgaria, quote unquote, Vlad Tenov. The hedge fund, Melvin Capital, Gay Plotkin, and the retail traders in the bandana in the basement were the players. If a video game was broken, if its software seemed suddenly filled with a bug, you don't blame the console, you didn't blame the players, you either blame the people who built the game, or you blamed whoever was powerful enough to change its code, and once had already been set in motion. Ken Griffin, I want to be clear with you. Five lawyers in the room telling them what to say. We had no role in Robinhood's decision, which limited trading in GameStop. I first learned Robinhood's trading restrictions only after they were publicly announced. And this man lied to oath because later it was exposed where you could see all the emails, texts, and things that happened between the two directly talking about shutting off the buy button and such. During the period of frenzied retail equities trading, Citadel Securities was able to provide continuous liquidity every minute of every trade day. When others were unable or unwilling to handle heavy volumes, Citadel Securities on Wednesday, January 27th, executed 7.4 billion trades on behalf of retail investors. To put that into perspective, on the day Citadel Securities executed more shares for retail traders, investors, and the entire average daily volume of the entire U.S. equities market in 2019. Back then, it was easy to dump on Vlad, Robinhood. It was easy to understand because people didn't understand what Ken does, so they couldn't blame him when he was a large pawn in the chess game. Then someone with intelligence of the stock market, a representative, Juan Vargas of California, did anyone from your organization have contact with Robinhood since January? Ken said, yes, we routinely talk to them. We manage a substantial amount of their order flow. Did you talk to them about restricting or doing anything to prevent people from buying GameStop? He said, let me be clear with you. Absolutely not. And how many people are in the room with you? Five. So meanwhile, he had five lawyers in the room telling him exactly what they said. It looks like he was reading off a teleprompter. There was no doubt Ken Griffin was at the center of what just happened, considering Citadel was one of the center of everything financial in the U.S. markets. The right questions were not asked during the congressional meeting to Ken Griffin. Keith Gill's turn to talk. Some famous quotes he said during the hearing. A few things I am not. I am not a cat. I am not an institutional investor, nor am I a hedge fund. During the hearing, a guy asked Keith Gill if he thought GME was worth buying at these levels of $45 at the time of the hearing. Keith said, I do think the price is attractive and I would buy at these prices. The other guy then laughed at him. After the hearing, Keith bought 50,000 more shares of GME 
and posted a YOLO update on Wall Street Bets and everyone went crazy on February 18th. Six days later, on February 24th, 2021, Jamie quadrupled from $40 a share to $190 a share in one hour, and we knew the game wasn't over. Wall Street Bets had 10 million users. One fund called Senvest team acquired 7% of GME stock at $67 a share and set it and sold it at 300s, pocketing 700 million on a perfect trade. During March 10th, the stock went back to 348 a share. April 20th, it went back down to 120, and by June, it went to 340 again. Ryan Cohen became the chairman, and they raised 500 million in market selling and 3.5 million shares in March, uh, raising 500 million, and then he did another. Uh, share offering for 5 million shares, raising $1.2 billion, eliminating all of its debt. So that's kind of where the book ends, but I have somewhere to add on to this because I'm following it forever. So they went from having all this debt and all these problems to then hiring 400 plus top executives from other companies such as Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook. Why are all these tech executives leaving their high end jobs over here and then joining GameStop? Doesn't really make sense, right? And then you started seeing them, all right. So they got, got rid of, imagine now, they have like 1.7 billion in cash. They got rid of all their debt besides a French loan from COVID at low interest rate at 40 million. So basically zero debt. The short thesis is now pretty much dead. They, have, they literally have more cash on hand than most other companies in existence. They started turning everything around. They started redoing their, they redid their whole app. They started selling more collectibles, more items. They started their own private label brand. They started having two hour shipping, partner with DoorDash from anything you buy here. They opened up two fulfillment centers, one 500,000 square warehouse in Reno, Nevada, another one in somewhere in York, PA, 700,000 square foot. Opened up two Amazon sized fulfillment centers on either coast in the US. Um, <clears throat> They have all that money. They started a blockchain team in 2021 before it was big. What's bigger than anything in the blockchain with video games? For those of you who don't know what NFT is, it's a one of one copy, which you can't recreate. The biggest thing right now is in game item NFTs. Right now, there's about, I want to say, 100 billion spent in the past, maybe 2019, there was 100 plus billion spent on in game items. Let's say Candy Crush gems, let's say Call of Duty skins, Fortnite skins. You can't trade these items, you buy it, and then they're worthless. GameStop wanted to code a platform to where you buy and sell these things through GameStop's NFT platform. So in the games now are NFTs where you own the in-game item and you can resell it on Jamie's marketplace. Meanwhile, the company might get 10% royalties and everything. GameStop coded the marketplace, they take 2.5%. And then the in-game person item, the person that owned the skin, it's 85%. It's a win-win-win across the board and it revolutionizes everything. So that no one ever talks about as well. And what happens when you have a video game where you buy right now for $60 and it's digital? It's like you can't resell it at all. And what happens when someone goes and codes the marketplace to then you can trade it? It's like amazing, right? Because now you can resell your video game, which before it was worthless. Once you bought it, it just sits there. Now you can resell it from $60, maybe resell it to someone else for 40 You just pocketed money. Again, Jimmy created the marketplace. They get X amount and these other people the person that made the game can get 10% royalties. So it is very, very endless. And then nowadays we have, I think the short interest is still 20 something percent. Um, and for those of you who don't know, there's something called direct registering your shares with computer shares. So before you had retailers over here where you buy your share from uh, a brokerage, Vanguard, TD Ameritrade, Robinhood, Fidelity, Charles Schwab. Above that, you have the market maker, the DD, DTCC, the clearing houses they made all the trades go through. And then over here, you have computer share where the shares are made. And right now, retail investors for the past two years, we've been taking our shares out of the clearing houses, out of the brokerages, transferring to where they were made from. And right now we have like, I wanna say 55, 60% of the whole GameStop float now locked in here by individual investors. I wanna say it's around 200,000 individual investors taking their shares over here and put them to computer share where they came from. This is the first time it's ever happened in history. And we're getting closer and closer to 100%. Once it's locked, you're about to see a thing where the buy button can no longer be shut off and you're gonna see craziness. So hope you guys enjoyed the video. Other than that, it's your boy. Have a good day and peace out.